So welcome uh, everybody. I'm um, happy to join uh, with you today for for this uh, fifth lecture of uh, this year edition of the uh, Shanghai Lectures. Uh, today, the topic uh, will basically be morphological computation. And uh, I will give, uh, as usual, I will give a basic introduction. When, uh, when our um, guest lecturer, Kayan uh, Zahedi, will uh, from the Max Planck uh, Institute for Mathematics uh, in Leipzig, very uh, pres uh, prestigious and uh, reputable institution, will give us uh, a more uh, a more technical, but still uh, we hopefully uh, understandable <laughs> by uh, every um, learned person willing to to understand uh, on, on the methods uh, to quantify morphological computation. <coughs> As uh, I have um, underlined, me and others have underlined uh, uh, very uh, several times uh, uh, why we are very pretty confident uh, on the um, principles uh, of, uh, if you call it, if you want, uh, uh, deep bioinspiration. So, methods of organization of intelligent agents uh, directly inspired by what happens in nature, we, um, we, we lack models. And today, we will uh, talk about uh, those models. Bef before, in a, maybe a more uh, um, qualitative way by, uh, by in my introduction, and uh, hopefully this introduction will uh, help uh, also, the understanding the, the more uh, uh, detailed uh, presentation which will follow. Um, of course, uh, you know that we have a huge archive uh, of um, past lectures, so, and uh, we use uh, to give you plenty of, of, um, of citations, uh, and we are available. Uh, me and uh, the guest lecturers, uh, and also through me, many of the past uh, uh, guest lecturers to, to give you any information that we may know. So you can actually tailor um, the level and, and the content of what you are interested to. This is our aim, because we believe that uh, AI, in particular embodied AI and cognition are uh, basic uh, uh, are, uh, so should be part of, also of the general culture of our age. So we I don't I, I, I will uh, I will skip this uh, so we skip uh, as we told so there are plenty of robots, uh, also very uh, complex uh, robots. Uh, just a minute, because I'm afraid that I am... Uh, that you are missing... Huh? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, just a minute, yeah, because uh, I'm... Uh, okay, I was checking if everything uh, is, is going... Okay, so just do you have the um, no? Ah, so you can hear if you are okay. because otherwise, if you so to know it in advance before. Okay, okay. so um, I, I will start, I, so I will start, I continue. <coughs> No, I was checking technically if we because it's too late. Oh. Okay, so let uh, I hope please uh, use uh, those of you who have my Skype um, 
address. Please, please send me a message if you see something uh, that is not uh, working properly. So, as we say, what they have in common this Juanelo Toriano, as we told, said, uh, this Juanelo Toriano's robots uh, of the 16th century and uh, uh, Hiroshi Shiguro uh, modern androids, uh, they have in common the idea that uh, state machines, a very complex state machine in the cases, in the case uh, of, of, of Shiguro's uh, androids, uh, control a mechanical system through actuators. We are um, looking for something uh, different. Uh, we, we, we aim to, to shape uh, the sensible behaviors that we are interested to, uh, as we told, uh, we are a bit skeptical about uh, uh, giving a definition of intelligence, but some behaviors that we used to call intelligent uh, and that uh, are uh, exhibited by many natural agents like uh, animals and plants. Uh, we, we aim to, to shape uh, a mechanism, a, a set of processes that uh, allows to uh, have a, a, the emergence of uh, uh, cognitive and uh, intelligent behaviors from the sensory motor, from sensory motor and interaction processes. Why? And we have also discussed two things that, uh, on the one hand, uh, the classical approach that someone uh, uh, call uh, the good old AI is uh, actually um, um, doomed, <laughs> impaired by the frame of reference problem, uh, as it is uh, exemplified uh, by the example uh, of um, of the hand of the beach proposed by Simon, uh, Albert Simon uh, already many years ago. So think, uh, concept, so you have this uh, ant moving on the beach uh, with some uh, stones, and it has a very, it seems uh, to have a very complex behavior. Just think that that ant, same ant is a thousand times bigger, and it will be completely different. So a lot, really a lot, of complex behaviors uh, um, emerges from the interaction of the agent uh, with uh. On the other hand, uh, we know we have problems, and that's why models like those we are going to discuss today and, uh, and are discussed in other places are useful, uh, are necessary, more than useful, is the, the symbol grounding or symbol, gra um, or symbol anchoring problem because we don't want to while in traditional in the traditional approach you the, the designer of intelligent system more or less knows already uh, so inject in the system when writing the code of the system put uh, all the necessary code so it does something very close to write the name of the things uh, on the things uh, themselves uh, in, uh, in our case, we don't want to have a preset uh, um, uh, set of, of, um, of symbols and concepts and rules, but we want them to emerge. This problem is extremely difficult, and we are basically starting to attach it. Uh, so what uh, we see in this approach, this picture, as I told you, our, uh, our textbook, but that must be actually uh, should be seen uh, as a, as a um, starting point for your personal uh, investigation and your personal study is uh, the book by uh, Rolf Pfeiffer, now almost 10 years old book, uh, How the Body Shapes the Way We Think, where you find really a, a number of uh, um, basic insights. Uh, that we are trying to convey in, in these lectures uh, on what, how we should uh, think uh, of uh, designing agents. These uh, uh, agents that could actually be the next uh, generation of robots. So we aim for a change of a basic technology to be and, uh, and principle to build robots. One of these principles is the complete agent principle. So the idea is that we don't have uh, Mm, disembodied uh, uh, abstract uh, intelligence 
intelligence system, but we only, we only know by experience uh, physically embedded intelligent systems. And, um, so they are subject to the law of, uh, of physics, they interact with the real world, affect the environment with their behavior, so I can move this back, for example. They are complex dynamical systems, also in the technical term, because uh, they are systems described by uh, differential equations that can be modeled in a, in a simplified way by the sets of, of uh, differential equations and perform morphological computation. The, um, and, and this is the top today's topic. So um, I, I don't, uh, since uh, we have a, a, a well, um, well, uh, well packed the agenda today, uh, I will, uh, uh, go straight here about the, the main difference between a non-linear and a linear system is that in linear system small effects small inputs change changes in the input lead to small changes in the output while in a non-linear system you you may have a big change in the input and small changes in the output or the opposite. This uh, um, is something, and then in linear system you have a superposition of, of uh, effects. So you, if you sum two small inputs, uh, the output will be the sum of two more or less small outputs. This doesn't happen with nonlinear systems, and um, a lot of the complexity of uh, uh, dy complex dynamical systems like. Uh, natural intelligent agents uh, arise uh, exactly from, from this uh, kind uh, of non-linearities and others. Uh, you have hysteria, so, but this is the basic principle a small input doesn't mean big, uh, uh, small in change uh, in, in the output. So this system and you may check about this, uh, the focus, this uh, 4.1 uh, uh, box uh, it, on uh, our body, are uh, actually um, described by nonlinear dynamics, Gauss theory. They have a space space, and they have a trajectory in this space space. But I promise it to stay um, away from uh, more technically, technical um, aspect that you can anyhow uh, go into deeper if you are interested. So we can set uh, a number of uh, design principles for intelligent systems that we may uh, we used to call them uh, deeply bio-inspired. Bio the uh, three constituent uh, principle, the complete agent principle, the, um, and I will tell three constituent principle, what I mean by that? I mean that basically any kind of intelligent behavior arises from a, a, a physical agent, a set of tasks, and an environment. If you think to the ant on the beach, you have the ant, you have the task which is end going from point A to point B, from, from a point on the beach to another point, and we have environment. The environment is made by sand and stones of different uh, dimensions. Of course, if you change the dimension of the stones, or you change the dimension of the grain of sand, or you change uh, the end, uh, the behavior will change. And also it will change if you, instead of, of uh, going from point A to point B in, in an ideal straight line, you will want to, 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 do, to, to perform a circle, no? You may, because think to a picture, you, you have also uh, the C. So it's not, I can say that the task is going from point A and point B on the, T on, on, on the beach uh, by an ideal straight, straight line, 
by my, I also wanted to perform a cycle. In this way, part the task is impossible because it should pass through uh, the beach. No? So, uh, and things, so you see the, and then we got the sensory motor coordination is something that we have talked several times. Then we have the principal chip design. The example is the, um, the um, biped, the passive biped worker. So I don't need that much control to have uh, uh, passive water going straight on, on over the beach, um, straight down a slope. So yeah, we, we, we may go uh, a lot deeper, but uh, what I was saying before can be um, as a design principle means that uh, we need to think about the environment uh, which uh, represents the ecological niche of a system. And uh, we have seen that uh, if uh, we uh, talk uh, about uh, the... Um, so evolution is a serious thing uh, in, in robot design, in particular when you aim to develop soft robots. No? Because uh, as we have seen in the first guest lecture and we have seen in the, in, in the guest lecture, uh, uh, actually guest lecture um, when you don't know what you want to optimize uh, evolution uh, is uh, a, um, a good uh, is, the, is, a, is the tool of choice so and for evolution you need to know what you want to um, to achieve, but you need to know the, uh, the ecological nature and the principle of the agent is shaped. You, you, we have many different shapes. What we want the agent to do in the case of the end, go from a point to another one uh, and where on the, on the beach, but uh, with that dimensions of the end, not bigger, not, uh, not much bigger, not much uh, more. Uh, the, um, because uh, the, the aim here is to, to um, get rid of uh, the, um, the artifacts. Now, what you typically happens, uh, I hope we, we can see, uh, I can show you in one of the next lecture, the, very interesting and very famous uh, example by by then no? because what typically happens when you follow the uh, and this is something that it, for those of you who have been uh, exposed to developing some robot for research or other purposes what usually happens is that you study your robot for a set of the uh, tasks in, in, a, in an environment with a set of um, uh, behavior. What typically happens is that you don't think to something that uh, then happens uh, um, in, in reality. And so you have artifacts in the perceptions. In the perception, you, you, you don't have a robust behavior. This, uh, all of this points to the need for having some for sure learning, and uh, uh, learning has been introduced in many applications but kind of self-organization. So we, we cannot uh, decide at design time of what uh, exactly the robot will do, because otherwise it will be. However, you, you may think uh, uh, it's also the, the mistake that uh, you can also do. Another kind of mistake that you, you may do is to uh, um, to think uh, that uh, until we don't redesign everything, uh, this kind of principles cannot be applied uh, to, to robotics. That's not true. Because, for example, saying that, saying that the principle that uh, the uh, physical interaction with the environment uh, is part of the interaction, or is part of the perception, or if you want, helps the process of perception can be applied also in, in ways that uh, could even seem uh, trivial, but they are not. For example, 
uh, in this work uh, in, in, by Giorgio Meta and Paul Fitzpatrick by many years ago, it was shown that uh, uh, on a standard humanoid, if you add uh, to, for the human, uh, if a humanoid doesn't recognize this pen because it is not uh, uh, in, in the right way, uh, position in the world, no, yeah. I can see it now, but I think if it is a bit darker uh, and it is on the table uh, in, in a strange place close to something else, uh, the best thing that I can do is to move the pen. And uh, at this point, uh, if I put together the flow of data um, coming from, from vision, uh, the, the flow of data coming from touch, and the fact that I have changed the position of the pen and so I I, I see how it transforms. This helps the perception. This was shown uh, in, in this uh, early example and uh, in other example, later in other example. So uh, we don't, uh, it would be a mistake to think that until we don't have uh, refought everything, we cannot use the principles that we are uh, I'm, by time discovery, no? step by step discovery. Another in important thought, uh, aspect uh, is uh, the, uh, that actually was uh, already uh, proposed by, by Brooks uh, in, in, in his paper in 80, 86, uh, uh, Intelligence uh, Without Representation, which was a kind of seminal uh, paper that you may want to check, by the way, um, was uh, actually um, proposing that uh, intelligence doesn't require a symbolic representation, but uh, emerges from a set of concurrent and parallel processes, as it happens, uh, in, for example, in locomotion of uh, insects. Of course, uh, we have in front of us the the challenge of this, defining methods to uh, shape this kind of uh, behavior. No? So, because this is what was shown by the video that I sh have shown you about the, from Harvard on the life of the cell. Um, the principles of intelligent behaviors in nature are emergent from system environment interaction you implement, are based on many loosely coupled processes. And the example that uh, was shown uh, 30 years ago in a paper and is actually implementing the Roomba robot vacuum cleaner um, today, this could be another interesting uh, um, hint uh, to a discussion on how long it takes to pass from basic research to uh, sensible application. So uh, Roomba has been a, around for 10 years now, but uh, from the 86 to the 2000 something, when we first heard of Roomba as a commercial product, uh, past 20 years have passed. Uh, so it's not, uh, it's not a small uh, amount of time. So the end, but uh, of course, uh, this, the advancement in basic research have uh, real advancement in basic research have much more impact than uh, simple thinking on the and what we are aiming to do with robotics actually. But, uh, so this is the model. This picture is uh, adapted from the uh, that paper from uh, Rodney Brooks in '86 and. Basically, it's a very it's clear because it's a very good explanation of what. So it's a representation of what we are trying to say. The classical cognitivistic approach foresee that we have a kind of a pipeline where we have perception. Then, on the basis of the data flow of a perception, we model. When we decide a plan plan that someone will have written and covered before in the code and then we act. So this model is called also sense model plan act 
or sensitive add. Uh, act where pink in this uh, context mean model and plan. Uh, this is very much in line with a certain philosophical, cultural idea of how we live, uh, develop uh, in the latest uh, few centuries uh, in, in Europe. Uh, this is culturally true, so in Europe we think in that way. Uh, now I would say everywhere we probably think in that way now, but uh, it's not necessarily the way that the brain works. So when we, I mean, uh, we, 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 all the people in this audience have been studying for uh, many years. So our mindset uh, is, is, it's a cultural mindset. It doesn't necessarily respect, uh, reflect the way our brain works uh, in the deep. And unfortunately, now on this planet, there are not wild people. Even people living in the forest uh, have a culture that have evolved during thousands of years. So we don't have access to uh, natural way of things in our mind. We need to study them outside. What uh, um, Brooks observed and proposed for robots was uh, that actually we have a set of concurrent uh, processes instead. So you have an exploration process, which is always here, a collecting object process that is also there. And in the case, you don't have in the case of the ant, or, or you may have, not in the example we, we discussed, but in general, ants going around to, to fetch food, huh? avoid ob obstacle and move forward. So the idea is that, think to the ant in the picture that we have seen. According to the classical cognitivistic approach, you will need to put in the robot ant a perception module, vision typically, maybe some, um, some touch, some force control, some force sensing and force control. Then from this module, I will have a model of the beach. Then I will plan a route from the point where I am to another one. And then I will start to move the, the, the legs. In this different model, I, since we are not considering the collection of objects, I will have an exploring behavior, meaning that uh, the ant is programmed to go around, more or less randomly, avoid obstacle. This means that uh, when uh, the ant will see an obstacle, will uh, move uh, a bit aside to avoid it and move forward. So move always when you can towards the um, final point. Now think that you have a flag on the beach and you look at it, uh, always try to go to the beach. If there is a stone, you move left or right randomly and then you forward. And this is this is the way Roomba, the Roomba vacuum clearer works. And it is quite good. Uh, the, and this, it's quite good. <coughs> A nice question could be, mm, but if he had, uh, because you see, the, um, how interesting is this? Because if you think to the Dyson vacuum robot vacuum cleaner sold uh, in Japan, the way it is uh, um, conceived, it's that it has perception and modeling in the, since it has a camera, the Roomba hasn't a camera, it uh, uh, has modeling capabilities because it has land, so it builds a map of environment and there's planning because on the basis on the, the map of environment, it will act, so it will move, um, sucking the dust from the floor, but uh, following the, the map, so filling the map, so by a logical map. So even at the level of, uh, um, robots that you can find in the shopping floor, you can appreciate completely different conceptual approaches. Uh, a, a nice question here yes, would be, so what's that hmm? uh, In a dark room, for sure, Roomba. 
in a well li um, lighted room, uh, we can discuss. The Dyson costs uh, three times uh, more or less uh, as, as much as the Roomba. Uh, so, um, even from an engineering perspective, uh, you also, or, or you not you may, you probably should have uh, um, a syncretistic or if you want an opportunistic approach, depending on the application, you may say that you follow the bio-inspired approach like Roomba, for instance, uh, you will never put uh, uh, vision guided vacuum cleaner in a dark room or um, or the, or the cognitivistic approach, uh, you know, the good old fashioned AI approach in other applications. Uh, I, this is, um, and mm, the, I think I, I told, so why I'm very positive about the impact that already with what we know robotic uh, can have uh, on manufacturing is that in a factory, uh, I can provide uh, illumination. Uh, so the environment of the factory is designed and controlled uh, by maintenance. So if my uh, vision is not so good as it happens, so it's very good, uh, but it, it has been uh, better, uh, so it could be better, no? We still uh, have to work on that. The, um, but all these issues in control of the structured environment, like factories, can be solved by maintenance, by design of environment. So what we are talking uh, about are complex tasks in open-ended environment, where it's likely that uh, the, this kind of um, deep, by inspired approach is a need more, it's a necessity more. Anyway, the very first, yeah, we have a picture of the very first implementation of the, of the principles that are now in the Roomba vacuum cleaner, which was the Genghis six legged robot. Anyway, you may ask yourselves if um, these ideas by uh, Rodney Brooks are uh, kind of uh, sorry, speculative ideas or if they point to something true. You, you, you remember that one of my favorite, uh, one of our, our favorite uh, um, idea is that uh, of uh, the synthetic methodology, no? meaning that robotics can, uh, building robots can also be a way to test if some principle that we believe to happen in nature, in natural agents uh, uh, work or not as expected. It's nice to see that uh, years later, I don't know if in, in influenced or not, uh, but uh, I mean, some ideas are in the air many times. Olto Kruse, a German biologist, study the way the control system of ants locomotions. So I think that ants are very, uh, a very, good source of inspiration because uh, um, they are closer to what we can implement now and think that an ant has soft legs has a lot of, of the small ears in the fingertips of the ant so it's already a very <coughs> complex robot with in comparison with to what we build now but uh, we can understand more than, for example, in my inner uh, uh, process of thought, right? So, because humans are much more uh, um, complex. So, we, we are talking of uh, people who have studied, because when you talk about, uh, uh, so it's a joke about uh, uh, human-robot interaction. Most uh, research of human robot interaction has been done on, by using as uh, guinea pigs young students. Uh, in the past, most of them were male. Now, luckily, we also have some uh, uh, some more girls. But the the idea was that uh, 
So it's a completely biased uh, testing set. So we young uh, students, no, yeah, not uh, young, um, um, I, I don't know, uh, streamers, not, uh, young uh, fisher, fishermen uh, of the coast uh, of Thailand. No, um, people working in university and um, studying for a PhD. Anyway, all the crews uh, studying this, well, have, have, uh, this is a fact, a scientific fact, that the way ants uh, coordinate their locomotion motion is both the, the same that was uh, uh, in the example by Simon. The nice thing is that Simon did the example in the 60s uh, on the basis of this in intuition of this use of AI, while well, this is a fact, set of facts. So ants don't have a central coordination for life. They only have communication between two neighboring legs, meaning that they have neurons, but the neurons uh, that control the different legs are disconnected one from the others. And they, and, uh, they exchange the information on, on the asset of the um, of a pose, no? as you say technically in mechanics, the pose and position is known through the reaction of the environment. So actually, in real ends, the mechanism is exactly what was suggested by Simon in the, uh, in by the beach uh, example. So it's the uh, terrain which basically uh, govern uh, the movement uh, of the uh, of, um, of the ant, uh, and this is uh, uh, an interesting fact because uh, this means that uh, the control of the of the ant is much simpler than uh, the um, the one of the um, of the um, that we have imagined. No? So the ant works like uh, the Roomba. So, please forgive me, guys and people. Uh, like the ants work are designed like the uh, Roomba, it's not like the, um, the Dyson. It's better, better. Should we do always like the ants? No, it depends. If you need to vacuum clean a room where you have good lights, it, it's basically uh, where is the. the um, and this might because uh, okay i will uh, this example of the rumba and the dyson is nice because if it's possible to have a map of course uh, you have time to build the map and by time uh, so the time to clean your uh, room is the time to build the map plus the time to uh, follow a uh, um, an intelligent plan to clean the, the net. If you use a Roomba, you don't need a map, you don't have a map, but uh, the, the vacuum cleaning has a, a strong vacuum compo uh, um, random component. The result will be that on an average, it will take more to clean the, the room. So uh, basically for this kind of application is a matter of, of choice. Because mm. also the initial fact that the Dyson vacuum cleaner is more was a, a, is more expensive than the Roomba can be. The, the, I mean, the price of, of of an object depends on many parameters. So if I sell many, the price will go down. But really, they are really different machines. They both have uh, a physical base. They both have uh, wheels. But the way they are designed is uh, basically different. Roomba, that actually came from uh, some uh, worries uh, of general uh, nature. Uh, so, uh, so the worry, so Brooks was uh, in those times uh, interested uh, in research. So he wanted to show, uh, it was nice to show the principle. It's nice to see that uh, actually ants. Uh, and in something that uh, is, I mean, because you may have seen photo when I showed you the um, the video 
of the proteins uh, connecting in a cell, you may think, okay, that's for life. Uh, but at high level, the locomotion control processes of an ant are emergent from a parallel, loose, coupled set of processes. So basically, the, this uh, highly deformable uh, legs move uh, more or less. Uh, let's, random is probably not the right word, but they, they move uh, in a, an almost random way. And uh, depending on the terrain, uh, the direct control between uh, two legs, so the, the composition of all these behaviors, which are disparate, so are uh, independent from one from each the other, lead to a plant moving on the beach from point A to point B. This is very interesting. There are other examples. The, uh, so now the social interaction robot by uh, Cinzia Brizal. Uh, I don't show you the video because uh, I am uh, a bit late. Uh, which is uh, conceived uh, on, on in the same way of a Roomba. So it has a mechanism which moves uh, it uh, towards the noise, uh, moves uh, towards moving objects. If an object moves slowly, it falls over the object. If the disturbance continues, it stops giving uh, again the principle of parallel. And you see, the Kismet is basically a classical robot. What is different, like Roomba, what is different is the way the behaviors are implemented. Yeah, I, I left to you this question. So uh, if you have seen the video, you check on the YouTube or or some other place, uh, the videos of this uh, system, you will see that uh, it's, um, it's very natural, no? So you, you have it almost uh, the feeling that it is uh, a, a real, so you, you feel that you have a kind of engagement with Kismet. And this uh, opens me. In a nice question. Like, so it's a social company, it's just uh, a set of concurrent uh, reflexes. Who knows? Um, this Kirsch Brook debate is very interesting because uh, points, uh, of course, I don't have uh, the time, but might be uh, a topic uh, traditionally has been in the Shanghai lecture a topic for student presentation. So I challenge you to uh, prepare a short, uh, say, say 15 minutes presentation on this debate. But in essence is, okay, tells David Kirsch, you really think that the principles which are clearly uh, working in insects uh, will uh, scale to the level of having a sentient, intelligent human? Do you think so? Uh, it was 1991, so it is tomorrow, man. Today, we probably use, we use a more politically correct word. So, please, uh, if you if you want uh, to take the challenge uh, next week or a couple of weeks from now, it would be nice to to listen to a presentation on this discussion, which basically is Kirsch saying that. Uh, um, those principles are good for some level of low level of behaviors, but they don't scale, meaning that uh, the principle of higher uh, level human uh, uh, level intelligence are different. I would say that today we don't have uh, so we, we that was a very uh, is a very conceptual would say philosophical discussion, and uh, please try to give your give us your opinion on that, present us them. So we just send me an email when you feel ready or you just want to take the challenge. But uh, it is, um, it, today is an open issue. So today the right answer is uh, we don't know. Because uh, to say that you know something scientifically, you need to perform experiments showing that it uh, works.
All these examples, the example of the end is a typical example, very similar to the biped worker example or the human like grasping approach. So let the arm go down, and, and uh, when you are, you feel the pen close uh, the uh, the end uh, in, in an almost a random way. So because it will be the form of the shoulder, the form of the muscle, and uh, the form of the hand to basically allow me to do this, uh, which is quite different from what we do. Uh, in, in the traditional approach to robotics, which is uh, calculating the point, uh, the, the, uh, the looking at the form of the pen, calculating where I have to, to put my rigid fingers to keep it uh, in equilibrium in terms of center of mass uh, and slippery, uh, and then calculating a trajectory going from here to here in, in, in the physical space and then calculating the so-called inverse kinematics or the trajectories uh, in, uh, my, in my joints that uh, I assume to be rotary, so simple rotation uh, while this joint and this joint have complex manifold shapes. Manifold means surface, right? So the, and they have the form of one, so it's quite quite different. The end is a, a, a more uh, uh, really ground level example in many senses, but shows the same principle. So the ends have, have a partially not so rigid uh, in the way and, and they exploit, remember the concept of stigma, so the interaction with the environment to, to move. We have a very general policy to follow. And that's morphological computation. So morphological computation in a very, in a nutshell, is to the fact that uh, many activities that are, I would uh, say, because if you compare the two examples, the, the uh, traditional robot arm and my arm, hmm, or your arm, in the traditional robot arm, I have a lot of code processing all this information. Huh? Yeah, I don't have a lot of code processing this information. I, think, I personally think I have more than in our current robots, but I don't have a lot of uh, stuff calculating the inverse kinematics. So in a very, in, the, in a simple model of this arm, I have very little computation. At this point, the question is, uh, let's think that here I have, uh, it's not an unrealistic number, 200,000 line of codes in, in, a, in, a, in a standard kind of code. I no? think uh, because uh, if, when you go in, uh, in the thousands of lines, uh, if it is a Fortran or C or another language, it doesn't matter so much. So yeah, I have 10,000 or lines of codes. Yeah, I have very few lines of codes. Where, where is the information missing? The, the information is in the behavior of the arm, which is guided by its morphology. This is morphological computation. And the question is, ah, good. But I will calculate that, no? because of this example that I'm showing you uh, quickly before leaving uh, the floor to, to Kayan, um, it's very nice. But uh, how I can, uh, uh, the problem with this uh, example, so the biped walker, the example that I do, uh, is that uh, they are coming from trial and error and intuition. We are looking for something more structured. We have seen that an approach can be evolving the structure. Uh, today, we are uh, looking um, to uh, approaches to, have to quantify in advance, as we usually do in engineering. It's quite um, likely that uh, we need both. So we need probably to evolve uh, uh, the systems, but uh, implementing in, in the evolutionary algorithms that we use for design, 
some principle taking care of the fact that I can or I, we can try now to model how much information is actually here. More or less uh, should be the difference of length be between this code, be between the code of, of uh, Asimo Arm, uh, Asimo's Arm and my code, no? so, so, over, or if you want, or of an arm using this. But how much is this? What I should do? How I should design it? This is a, an open issue. And there are many models. I, I go very quickly through the, this kind of thing. Um, I, I, I can, again, I can direct to it. Based on model, uh, for instance, I propose a model based on a probabilistic model of control. You can derive some equation, some quantities that need to be uh, checked. Uh, this, uh, I close before giving the floor to Kayan uh, with this example by Tanev already several years ago, where the nice thing is that by simply uh, modeling a snake with a set of balls loosely coupled with each other and uh, imposing that it uh, maximize uh, an information matrix, so the predictive information, so the capability, if you want, a measure of predicting the next value of the actuator on the basis on the serial uh, temporal values on, a sen on the sensors, it uh, shows a behavior which is very similar to that of a real snake with a, a very small abstract program. The, the suspect that is better that, that the, uh, the way to go. So I'm, uh, I, I close here my, my part and uh, I, 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 I now introduce the um, today's guest lecture which is exactly on this topic. So how I can quantify the amount of behavior modeling, uh, behavior generation that I have in this structure. You will see that it's not uh, so easy, but it, but it is feasible. And uh, it only requires uh, to um, requires some new mathematical approaches that maybe are not so familiar in the robotics uh, community, for example, or in the AI community, not yet, but uh, are mm, nothing magic. And as they are coming from the human brain, they can be easy, they can be understood. Just, so I'm happy to leave the floor to Kayan uh, Gazi Zaidi from the Max Planck Institute uh, in Leipzig, which will give us a talk exactly on quantifying morphological computation. So, Kayan, first of all, welcome. Uh, thank you for accepting our invitation. And Can you hear me? Or... Yeah, Hello? <laughs> yes, I can hear you. I can hear you. So please, Kaya, welcome and please go ahead. No. Kaya? No. Okay, and I can see you. Now you can hear me, right? Now, yes. Ah, okay, it was off. Now I'm... Ah, okay, okay. okay. I will okay. start again. Welcome, and thank you for accepting the invitation. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm excited to present here. 
So I'm talking about quantifying morphological computation. Current research I'm conducting with colleagues here at the Max Planck Institute for Mathematics and the Sciences. I like to motivate my work by this video by um, Kilian Bogada. He's a six-time world champion in skyrunning. Skyrunning is a competition where you basically run a distance of one to three marathons up in the mountains. One track, for example, is in Switzerland. It's roughly 40 kilometers with an elevation of four kilometers. And they take about four hours for this track to run. I wouldn't stand it for 10 minutes. And the reason I like to show this video is that um, you will see in a second the sequence where Kilian runs uphill on uneven ground. And um, it is impossible, now this, that's the sequence, it would be impossible for him to do this if he had to construct a precise 3D model of environment, right? And on this sequence you see, you can see that he tiptoes uphill, right? So what he does is he uses the elasticity of his muscle tendon system and that allows him not to make a model of, of 3D model of environment, right? So by exploiting his, his um, properties of his body, he can compute less in his brain and do this very impressive running over, over the mountains. And what I would like to do is, I would like to, whereas in this sequence you can see how he controls the stiffness of his muscles to, slow, um, to slip downhill, right? And what I would like to do is, I would like to record a behavior like this and afterwards answer the question, how much of this behavior was actively controlled by the brain and how much of this behavior resulted from body environment interactions. That's my goal. Okay. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to define morphological computation as the contribution of body environment interactions that re reduce the amount of computation that the brain or controller has to do. So the question now is how can we quantify this? And as we have just seen in the talk by, by Fabio, this is a sensory motor loop as it was presented by, by Pfeiffer in, in his paper in science. Um, so I'm going to go very briefly over it. We have a controller that sends motor signals to the actuators. The actuators influence the environment. So if I pick up a glass, for example, I can influence the environment. But also the glass influences my actuators because it limits how my fingers can, can move. Then we have the sensors which read internal states and external states. So my eyes read the environment, my, my muscle sensors read the, the, um, the state of my muscles, and then the loop is closed when the sensors feed back to the controller. And what we do in our approach, we add a new um, concept to this, we call, which we call world. And by world, we mean everything that's physical, everything that can be seen from an external observer. So that would be my body and my environment. And that we subsume into one, one category, which we call world, which is external to the, to the um, embodied agent. And this is a video I'd like to show. It is a video of a um, sensory motor loop in action. There's a baseball player in practice who tries to catch a ball. And this wouldn't be possible if you wouldn't have a tightly coupled sensory motor loop. Now, from this, we need a mathematical model. And this is what we show down here. It's called a causal graph. So these letters are random variables and the connections between the, can I stop this? Yeah. The random variables between those, um, sorry, can I stop it? Um, show mechanisms cause relations. So beta tells me how my agent perceives the environment. So this is the world state, for example, my body pose and the position of other objects in my environment. And beta will tell me, for example, how my, my um, eye perceives the environment and which kind of information it gives to the brain. Pi, the policy, now for this we have only reactive systems as a simplification, takes my sensor value and generates an action from the sensor value. And alpha, my world dynamics kernel, tells me how the world progresses. So from, let's say, my current body position to my next body position, how does that change in the context of the action that the agent generates? And the question that I just formulated is now, how complex is my policy? How much computation happens in the brain? That's what I program as a roboticist. And how much computation is done, let's say, by, by alpha? This is what I construct as a roboticist. And I'm looking to understand how the computation is distributed between these two, these two maps. So how do we do this? 
So we start again with the sensory motor loop, the causal diagram of the sensory motor loop. And basically we want to measure the strength of this connection. We want to understand how much my current, let's say body position or body movements influence my next body movements. So the first step, we assume that this is not present, right? And this is not the case in any natural system, but in the theory, we can think um, what would happen if this connection is not present? And in this case, if you now look at the behavior over time, so the sequence of world states, the sequence of body positions, think of Kilian Bogada running downhill, there'll be a sequence of these Ws. And if this connection is not present, now we see that the entire sequence is fully determined by the policy, by the brain, for example. So in this case, we would say we have no morphological computation, right? Because everything is fully determined by the action of the system, which is generated from the brain of the system. So now we can take this as our assumption and we can compare it with our observation, right? This is now our observation on the left-hand side. And if our observation differs from our assumption, that means that this connection from W to W prime is present. And the more it differs, the more this one differs from this one, the stronger this connection is, right? So that's a way to to measure, it's one way to measure morphological computation is by assuming it is not present at all and then seeing how much, how wrong our assumption is basically. And the way to do that mathematically is by um, what's called the Kullback Leiter divergence. Um, this is shown up here. Um, it's a way to, to calculate the difference between two probability distributions. For those who know about information theory, this is also known in this case as the conditional mutual information of W prime of my next world state, my next body position, and my current body position conditioned on, on the action condition that I know what the action of the agent was. This equation is just to show that it can be easily computed from observation. All I need is the joint distribution of W prime, W and A, that basically means I just have to record the body position or the, body, or the state of the, the, the world over time and the actions over time, that gives me this joint distribution. And if I have this joint distribution, there's an easy way to calculate this conditional distribution from this joint distribution. So this shows it can be easily computed from, from observations. And for those of you who are not so familiar with information theory, I like to use this equation to explain what's actually going on. This is a conditional entropy. That means how uncertain is something, right? And to maximize morphological computation, we want to maximize this first term, which means we want to maximize the uncertainty of our next world state, let's say my next body position, um, given the action. That means my next body position should be as independent of, of my action as possible, right? But this could also mean it's fully random behavior. So now we look at the second term down here, which is the conditional entropy of my next world state given my current world state and my current action. So the uncertainty about um, my next body pose, for example, given my current body pose and my current action, and this should be minimal, right? So it should be independent of the action, yeah? but it should be de de deterministic given that I know my body position and my, my action. So independent of the action, but not random. That's what this what this quantification is is measuring. So it's exactly what what is going on here. Now this is one of the quantifications I'm looking at, and um, I'm trying to understand this in more detail, and also finding improvements and variations of this. And to give you an overview of what's happening, this is um, um, the current state of of the research in in this in this. Um, in this field, where I look, this is the one I just showed to you, and then I, I do some decomposition, I look at alternatives, um, but I think that's just enough detail on this. The reason I showed you this slide is to, to show you that there's way more theory behind this, but it would take very much time to, to explain all of this. So if you're interested, I'm giving um, also some references in the end where you can go into more detail. What I'm now showing you is applications of this quantification, this conditional mutual information to measuring morphological computation in real and simulated systems. And the first one is in the context of soft robotics. This is the RBO hand two of the Technical University in Berlin. 
If it's a soft robotic manipulator made out of silicon, so the fingers are basically hollow silicon chambers powered by, by air pressure. And I like this video in particular because it shows how this hand um, um, grabs a bar out of a bowl, very similar to how humans do that or how I would do this. We, this um, the hand first pushes, so it exploits the environment, pushes the bar to the side of the bowl, lets it fall into the hand, and then it can, can pull it out. So it's very similar to, to how humans would do it. Now the problem is um, how to construct such a system, right? <clears throat> Let's think of one finger, which is basically a hollow in silicon chamber. If I would now pump air into the system, it would blow up like a balloon, right? And this is not a very helpful behavior if you want to do some grasping. So what you have to do is you have to constrain some of the movements of the finger so that it closes instead of just blowing up like a balloon. And this requires a lot of um, expert knowledge, a lot of trial and error up to now. And what we would like to have is a system where we could define a task, for example, grasping a number, a set of objects, and have an automated system that then generates for us the best morphology that requires the least amount of control to do this. And that's what I'm going to talk about in the next couple of slides. So, um, <clears throat> Just to, as a reminder, what do we mean by morphological computation in this context? This is a simulation of this RBO hand, too. And I'm not sure if you can see that very well, but this is um, a simulation where we use the what we call prescriptive behavior. That means now that the hand movement is fully determined only by the command sequence. So in this case, we have um, disabled collision detection this beige kind of structure is actually a table. And you can see that the hand goes through the table and moves upwards. So there's no body environment interaction. This is just what the hand would do if only the, if it only obeys the command sequence. And now we put it into an environment with an object and we turn on the collision detection. It is again, this very same sequence of actions. Only the environment has changed. And now we can see that the trajectories of, the, let's say, the fingertips differ from what the command demanded it to do. <clears throat> so um, the behavior is, of course, determined by the controller and the shape of the hand. But the table and the object also contribute to, to um, the observed behavior. And we see that if we now change, in this case, the, the shape of the objects, now we have a, um, not a cylinder anymore, but a sphere and some kind of a box shape. And now the hand adapts to the shape of the, of the object. Still the same action sequence that is shown here on the left-hand side, but now the behavior differs depending on the object and the, and the table. And that's what we call morphological computation, right? The contribution of body environment interactions to an observed behavior. So how can we now um, exploit this in some kind of automated design process? So the first step is we do a bunch of experiments, changing some parameters of the hand, let's say the spreading of the fingers, for example. We also change the object size and position and orientation and do a bunch of experiments in this case. <clears throat> I'll explain all of the steps in more detail in a second. So the second step is um, <clears throat> from this um, experiments, we extract the component of the behavior that only results from body environment interactions. I'll explain in a second what that means. From these um, difference behaviors, from the behavior that only <coughs> results from body environment interactions, we generate a low dimensional representation of this behavior. And then we do some clustering based on these matrices. And then we can see, and I'll explain that in a second, that, that these clusters in, are informative to tell us how to, how to reshape the hand in the next step to get a better grasp. So what are the steps? After conducting a set of experiments, what we then do is we extract the components of the behavior that only result from body environment interactions. And this is what's shown here. So on the left-hand side, we have the actual experiment, the actual grasp in the environment. And on the right-hand side, what we have here is the prescriptive behavior. So again, no collision detection. This is the behavior that only results from the, um, from the, from the command sequence, from the controller. 
And what we can now do is we can over time just subtract the two from each other, right? So here on the left hand side, this sequence is this sequence, and the center one down here is the right hand side up here. And now in every time step, we simply subtract the coordinate frames of this one by this one, and that means we we take the behavior that is induced by the controller and body environment interactions, we subtract from it the behavior that only results from the controller, and the resulting behavior must be the movements of the hand that result from body environment interactions. And you can see that if the sequence restarts, in the beginning there's no change, right? But as soon as the hand touches the table and the object, then we see some movements in this um, stick figure um, um, video on the right hand side. So then we started once from the beginning, now it touches the ground, now we see um, how the hand moves as a result of body environment actions. And you see the stretching of the fingers because this hand on the right hand side up here closes more than the one on the left hand side. That's why the fingers stretch instead of um, compressing. So now we operate only on this set of behaviors, only on this recording, because that is what, what happens from body environment interactions. And the next step is to, to um, construct a low dimensional representation of this. Now this is a representation of our simulated hand. It consists of 31 coordinate frames, each having an X, Y, Z coordinate. And what we now do is we calculate the covariance matrix between each component of each coordinate frame with each component of each other coordinate frame. So 31 times three means 93. And calculating the covariance between all the components means we have a 93 by 93 covariance matrix. And the co if coefficients in this matrix tells us how the systems behave, for example, if we have the Z coordinate of this finger and the Z coordinate of this finger, we have a high correlation coefficient. That means that if, um, if I move my, this, this part upwards, for example, this one would also move upwards. So these two always move together, right? That means that this co um, covariance um, matrix has information about how the, um, the coordinate frames of this finger move together or, <clears throat> or did not move together for a specific grasp. The next step, we take now these matrices and we cluster them using TISME. It's a very nice clustering algorithm. Each dot now is one of these matrices, right? And the distance here tells us something about how close these matrices are. So if I would take the L2 difference of two dots here, for example, like the component, dif the component wise difference of the matrix, matrix, I would see a low difference here. But if I would take the one down here, for example, with the one up here, um, I would see a, a high difference. Now we can roughly see that there are maybe two or four clusters. Now the question is, how does, what do these clusters represent? Remember, the clustering only occurred um, depending on the covariance matrix. Nothing else went into the clustering. So the first step is to color these clusters by the object shape and the object's position. So here down here on the left-hand side, what we see is the object's um, position. So we change the position orientation, and we see that the clustering is not well explained by the position of the object, which is a nice thing. So we didn't cluster an artifact. Also the same on the object shape, which is on the right-hand side down here. And again, we can see some kind of, explanation of the clusters, but we have a lot of blue dots on the outside of these. So also that this clustering did not occur depending on the object shape, which is also a very good thing. So we didn't have this kind of artifact in our data. So what explains this kind of clustering? <clears throat> Next step, we colored it by the grasp um, success, measured at the grasp as a distance of the object through the center of the hand in the last couple of time steps. So lower is better in this case. So we see these blue dots up here. These are good grasps. Some mixture we have down here, but in general, we have a very nice um, explanation of the clustering, right? The grasp distance of the grasp success was not part of the clustering. We did this post hoc, right? We colored these dots by the grasp distance. 
and we see that there's a very nice distinction between good and bad um, graphs, only depending on this covariance matrix of the body environment interactions. And then we, what we also did, we did the coloring based on this quantification I showed you in the beginning. And very nicely we see that not only does the, is the clustering explained by the grasp success, but also by the amount of morphological computation. So um, color, the more colorful, the more reddish, the higher the morphological computation. That means the more the hand actually contributed to our um, grasp success. So we have these very nice clusters up here. And then we would, in the next step, look for a cluster of the high density. This would be this cluster showed here by those red circles. And then we would take maybe one or two or several representatives of these, these dots, of these um, matrices. And now what we could do is, and that's the step we're currently working on, now I can draw conclusions because the covariance matrix tells us how neighboring coordinate frames should interact, right? The high value means that they should always move together, so maybe we should make that a bit more stiff. The low value means that they don't move together, so maybe we should make this less stiff. So we could use this information to, to reshape the hand in the, in the next step. So to summarize, we start with a bunch of experiments, then we extract um, the components of the behavior that only result from body environment interactions. From that, we generate a low dimensional representation. And then based on this low dimensional representation, we do a clustering and then we take um, clusters with high density, good graph success and high morphological computation, analyze the similarities between the matrices and use information from automated, automated design process. Currently, we're working on this last step, but the other steps have been completed so far. So that's one application in the context of, of soft robotics. And the next application is in biomechanics. So I want to understand, or you want to understand um, morphological computation eventually in humans. But this is a prelim preliminary um, experiment. <clears throat> together with Daniel Häufler, um, he has a very nice um, model for, for muscle, this is shown down, shown here. Um, AT is the input signal to the muscle, and that would be, for example, the, the um, um, action potentials the brain sends to, to the muscle. Then the force that the muscle can, can show for behavior depends on the on the signal coming from the brain, some kind of maximal value. And then we've got two components here. FL is a component that depends on the length of the muscle. This is this Y here. And FV is a component of the force that depends on the velocity. So how fast does it compress or decompress, right? And then we can what we can do is we can parameterize FL, FV, so the components of um, of the force, which depend on the on the length and the velocity of the muscle, and then what we did, we um, had three models. I will show them in a second, um, and we let the systems jump up and down. It's shown down here. And now we can ask the question: For this jumping, how much did the muscles actually contribute, and how much did the brain have to do? Right, and this is shown here. So our first muscle model is nonlinear. And it means that the force length component and the force velocity component are both nonlinear functions. The second one is what we call the linear model. It has a constant force length component to, to the muscle um, force you can show and a linear um, force velocity component. And we compare that to the DC motor. That's a classical stepping motor kind of system where you give an angular position and then the motor tries to, to get this angular position. And now we're using the same quantification I showed in the very beginning. We can ask for, for this hopping movement, how much do the muscles contribute to this hopping? And that's again to show the difference. So here's this nonlinear system and here's this linear system. And now computing, we can see that for this hopping, the nonlinear muscle model contributes on average 7.2 bits. The linear muscle model contributes 4.975 bits. And it's very close to the DC, or not MC, but DC motor model, which also contributes roughly 4.99 bits. So that's an interesting result that we that um, 
confirms the hypothesis that um, the nonlinear muscle model contributes more to a hopping behavior than the linear muscle model. A bit surprising was that the linear muscle model is almost as good or as bad as the DC motor model. But the interesting part here now is that we can not only do that for the entire behavior, but we can look at every point in time, how much did the muscle model contribute? And this is shown here. The lower part shows the position of the muscle over time. So when the curves hit this orange line, that's when the muscle um, touches the ground. If the curve is below this orange line down here, that means the muscle is contracting. If it's above the orange line, it means it's, it is in a flight phase. And above, um, I plot the morphological computation at every point in time for the system. So now we let the system drop, they're above ground, and when these lines touch the, the orange line, that's when the muscle touches the ground. And we see that um, while this is all these three systems, so the nonlinear, linear, and the DC motor model, we see why uh, they are in, in the air. So the behavior is only determined by, by gravity. They are all very much the same. And now they touch ground, and now we see a difference between the behaviors, right? The orange and the green line are the linear motor model, linear muscle model and the DC motor. And we see now that the behavior, the contribution of these models to this behavior decrease, right? So that they're more controlled by the, by the controller than contributing. But the, the nonlinear muscle model, the blue line, interestingly, um, increases very much while compressing, and even increases above the value that we have while it is flying in air. So we can see that the nonlinear muscle model really contributes to the behavior of the system, right? And it, it stays quite high for a long time, even when, it, um, when the system starts start to jump again. And then while all three systems are, are in air, so that they're kind of flying, we see that these three curves are the same, what should be expected. And then when they touch ground again, we see this reoccurring behavior that the nonlinear muscle model contributes a lot to the behavior. So this quantification I showed you in the beginning not only allows us to quantify how much um, the system does over time, but it also allows us to look into the system at every point of time and understand how much it contributes while the system is behaving. Okay, so that's um, my current research on quantifying morphological computation, but I'm also trying to understand um, better what, what, what we actually mean by morphological computation. Um, yeah, so um, it seems that, that from this very central concept in the beginning, we have now more narrow understanding, at least if you look into literature, I did a, a large lit literature research, and what I found is that we have basically um, five or six different ways how the morphology contributes to computation or to, com to behavior. And if you look into the literature, you see kind of a diversification of this concept, right? You find morphological computation, morphological control, pre-processing, cross-processing, even brain layout. So let me give you a brief example what what um, what is meant by this kind of um, terms in, in the literature. Morphological computation, the term was first coined by, by Paul in 2006. And she gave a very nice example by this XR robot. It is a very simple thought experiment. It is a robot with a single wheel and two motors <clears throat> and two inputs, A and B. And um, we, one motor controls, M1 controls the rotation of the system, of the, of the wheel, and M2 controls the position of the wheel. So if M2 is untrue, the robot pulls the wheel up so it wouldn't, it wouldn't move, it wouldn't touch the ground. And now we can have a look how this system behaves depending on the values for A and B. So this is a Boolean system. So A and B can have true and false. And now we can look at the first motor, which is a or B, right? So we can see the, 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 the Boolean table for the system. On the left-hand side, A and B means that the wheel moves if either A or B is true. So it, it moves in most of the cases. Now we look at the other side. This is A and B. And remember, if, if A and B is true, then we pull up 
and we pull the, the wheel into the system. So it touches ground if this function is false. That's why you put true up here and false down here. Now, what does the system do? Given these two inputs, how does the system behave? And what we see is that it implements XOR, right? It only moves if either A or B is true and the other one is false. Now, if, if you look into the wi wiring of the system, we don't find an XOR anywhere programmed into the system. The XOR is a specific property of the morphology of this of the system, right? So in this case, the body computes the XOR, it's not the brain computing the XOR. And we see this now in more current research and in the more sophisticated um, way. This is an example by, by um, um, Nakajima, where he has a silicon um, 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 octopus arm. Uh, moving in, in water, and you've got a set of sensors here where you can measure the, the angle of, of, of this, uh, the movements of this octopus arm in water. And what he, can sh what he shows in this work is that using this dynamics of this water tank where this arm is moving passively in this water tank, you can train an output layer in such a way that you can, that you can um, simulate some nonlinear dynamical systems. And the theory behind this is called physical reservoir computing or reservoir computing, which is developed, was developed for recurrent neural networks, um, which have some internal dynamical properties that have um, oscillators of various um, um, orders. And then you just train an output layer, harnessing this internal dynamics of this neural network, but not training this net, uh, this synapses, just this output layer. And you can show that you can, that you can, um, approximate um, very complex um, nonlinear dynamic equations. In the same way, you can, you can do that with physical systems. And Helmut Hauser is, is um, working on this very intensively. And I've seen he has various um, talks, also in Shanghai lectures, which I would recommend um, watching if you're interested in this approach to morphological computation. Now, morphological control is um, if you take now this signal that was generated by the morphology, for example, the octopus arm or the output of the XOR, and feed it back as a control signal. This was done in, in this spine driven robot where you have um, some, how you say, um, dynamical components here in the, in, the, in the spine, some soft components in the spine, which are driven. Um, by some oscillating uh, system. And then you got sensors which read out the state of the spine. And these now is again treated as a physical reservoir computing, but the outputs are fed back into the motors to drive the spine robot. So part of the control, part of the computation that is required for the system to work is outsourced to the physical dynamics of the spine, to this physical reservoir computing of the spine robot. Another example is pre-processing in sensors. This is an example of an insect eye and the way the retina cells are distributed in, in such an, an, an insect um, makes it easier for the system to do a motion detection. So it's got a higher resolution to the front and a lower resolution to the sides. And that um, makes it easier for the system in terms of computation to de detect motion. Then we've got post-processing and actuators this is, I have briefly shown you in, in, um, in this hopping example, right? So some of the, some of the behavior um, results from how the, the muscle interprets the, the action potentials. One very interesting aspect I found in literature is even the brain, brain layout reduces the amount of computation. There's an example of saccadic eye movements where um, the retina cells are connected to the motor cells in such a way that the processing, the calculations required for the saccadic eye movements are reduced. And then, very importantly, there are also physical processes happening in the body um, that do not reduce the amount of computation, right? So this is the example of gecko and the gecko feet. They use a physical effect that allows them to walk um, um, very slippery or very I say, smooth surfaces. Um, now, <clears throat> without this, physical, exploiting this physical effect, it would not be able to walk up this smooth surface. But 
this does not reduce the amount of computation, right? The walking behavior is still the same. If it has or does not have this physical effect, that does not reduce the amount of computation that the brain has to do for this walking. So we will have to distinguish between this kind of processes. Now, my problem is, um, is computation the right way to, to um, capture all these different contributions of, of morphology to intelligence, right? Computation clearly in the first part of the XR um, robot is a very good way to describe that. Also maybe in the second part, we clearly have computation in the system, physical reservoir computing is, is the key here. But is the distribution of, of retina cells, is this really part, is this already computation? Is post-processing and actuators, is that actually computation? I don't think that that is a very helpful discussion in this context. Is brain layout part of computation? I don't think so. So what I would like to do is I would like to have a way of describing this very central concept, in my opinion, of embodied intelligence, how the body contributes to behavior. And I like to have a, a way to, to incorporate all this kind of different ways the body contributes and not just limit it to to let's say we can have Turing completeness or very specific ways of computation um, that apply to physical systems. And the way I'd like to, and I'm sure there's more, if, if you dig more into literature, there'll be more ways the body contribute. And then there's a very nice work by Vincent Muller where he describes um, a couple of these different, different ways the body contributes. So the way I would like to proceed in the future is I would like to call this um, maybe morphological intelligence. Now, this seems like replacing one buzzword by another, but I think computation has a very high baggage, right? You immediately think about Turing completeness or maybe other models of computation. And it's very difficult to fit all these different ways the body contributes into this notion of, of computation. Now, using this is inspired by David Karkauer's notion of intelligence, where he, um, on a, on a very broad level says, intelligence means um, making a difficult problem easy and stupidity means making an easy task difficult, right? And the way I see the morphology is, it makes a difficult task of control easier if it is well designed. So I think that morphological intelligence is a way, it's a more inclusive way to, to look at all these kind of different contributions. And I would like to propose this, this definition where Morphological intelligence describes the reduction of computational cost, and by that I mean any kind of cost. It could be computational cost, energetic cost, maybe even thermodynamic cost. Um, so it reduces the computational cost for the brain resulting from the morphology and its interactions with the environment. And if you now look at this different ways the body contributes, I think they're all included in this, in this definition, right? Morphological computation clearly is included, control is clearly included, even pre-processing, right? Because now the brain has to do less computation if the centers are well distributed. The same with post-processing, also brain layout, if the brain is um, um, structured in a way that makes it easier, or you have to do less computation. Also, this is included in this definition. And it will also exclude physical processes, which do not reduce the amount of computation the brain has to do. And then finally, I would like to um, also mention my collaborators, Nihat I and Guido Montefa, with whom I'm very, working very closely on this subject, Daniel Häufle and Sun Schmidt, with whom I'm working on this biomechanics of, of, of this, um, in this context. And finally, Oliver Borg, Raphael Damel, and Vincent Wall from the TU Berlin, with whom I'm, I'm working on, on the soft robotics. And finally, for some references, if you want to look into more details, these are my publications on the system. And with that, I'd like to thank you and ask for questions. Okay, thank you for, for this very inspiring uh, and interesting talk. Um, my, I have a general comment that, uh, for, that uh, so we see that uh, after several years, uh, we, we, we started to have uh, models uh, workable, workable models. And this is, uh, so we, it's not uh, uh, a discussion on uh, conceptual discussion, something that uh, in time uh, will be probably embedded in a new generation uh, of robots. This is my, I'm perfectly convinced of that. Maybe with some uh, 
small changing equations, but uh, uh, things that, so. uh, stuff <laughs> like this is going to in, inspire a new breed of much better robots. This is my, I don't know if we have questions. Yeah.